Hey everyone, I'm Kayla Martin Gant from the Mississippi Library Commission, and this is Summer Screams, a Reader's Advisory webinar all about horror. Uh, in this webinar, I'm going to tell you about like just some of the recent and upcoming 2021 horror titles. Plus, I'm going to give you some resources to help you provide good RA services for your patrons who are looking for that kind of thing. So, y'all ready? Let's jump in. Real quick, just a little bit about me. Uh, I am the continuing education coordinator here at MLC. And prior to that, I was a reference and genealogy librarian, as well as a teen librarian, not quite at the same time, but close enough. Uh, I'm also a writer of both fiction and creative nonfiction and academic stuff. And um, while I do tend to like branch out when I'm really interested in something in particular, I have always, always, always loved spooky, scary stuff, as you can no doubt tell from the photographs that I've provided here. Uh, as you can see there on the left, like I not only have a lot of horror books in my office alone, that's just a small selection. Um, but that photo in the bottom left is uh, an anthology box set. It is Bruce Koval's box of thrills and chills, which came with Bruce Koval's book of monsters, book of ghosts, book of nightmares. And then um, I lost the book of aliens somewhere because at the time that I got this box, I wasn't like super into aliens and I replaced it with the book of nightmares too. Um, but either way, I have had that box set for literally 23 years. Uh, if you were to zoom in on that photo, all 23 of those years would definitely show they are straight up falling apart. Uh, pages are coming out and I have to like keep tucking them back in. Uh, but I've read and reread the stories in those books so many times over the years that I like, I could never get rid of them. Um, I even wrote a whole blog post about like why people love horror, uh, especially me, and why it's important to so many people um, for MLC recently, which you can find in the additional handout that I made for you guys, uh, the link for which is going to be in the video description. Uh, so that said, I am aware that not all of you are like me. And that's that's okay. Helping your patrons find all the scary books they could want may just like not be in your wheelhouse. That's fine. I've got some really, really great resources, though, that are going to help you out. So in order to help people find the right flavor of horror for them, you need to understand a little bit about horror as a genre. And that is where all of these fancy shiny links come in. So this first one, uh, Horror, Defining the Genre, Subgenres, Styles, and More by uh, Annie Neugebauer. I uh, don't know if I pronounce that right. Terribly sorry. Um, but uh, this is an article on Lit Reactor. It's a really great column, and it's got this amazing infographic uh, that can really help you get to the basics um, and kind of like really start your understanding. And it's super easy to get through. Very visually pleasing. Love that. Uh, there's also the Novelist Crash Course in Horror webinar. Um, it's also an excellent introduction. You can't really go wrong with like a Novelist Crash Course. Um, but here is like the mother load. This is uh, the Horror Readers Advisory, How to Help Your Scariest Patrons from Becky Spratford. Um, she's the one who runs RA for All and its sister blog, RA for All Horror. Um, this is her most recent like presentation slide deck and it's gonna tell you everything you need to know to learn about the horror genre and how to like really, really, really up your RA game. Um, I've also linked the RA for All Horrors like resource page uh, that she provides. So with this slide deck, like what I would do is, you know, click on it obviously, but um, save a copy for yourself uh, in case, you know, there's some formatting issues. But like, y'all, there are so many like, excellent slides, excellent points, and excellent links and resources, and plus just like a lot of books that you should already have in your collection if you don't yet. Um, I think this, uh, like I said, is her most recent iteration of these, and um, I think it's dated November 2020. Um, so, you know, for all I know, she'll probably have a new one coming out soon, but what she also does have coming out soon is um, her Reader's Advisory uh, horror book, the third edition. That's, I think it may already be out. Um, I think it came out in August. So be on the lookout for that because it looks very, very, very good. Uh, and we are going to have it at MLC, obviously, if I have anything to say about it. Uh, so then this last thing, um, why does horror matter? This is um, a recording from the, the Ladies of Fright podcast, which is great. Um, but this is a recording of a panel from StokerCon 2019. And uh, this has uh, Becky Spratford and Stephen Graham Jones and a whole bunch of other um, big horror authors just discussing like why horror is important. Um, and why we need it and why it's so great. And so if you wanna listen to people who aren't me yell about this, like that's where you need to go. 
So uh, Dario Argento is an uh, Italian film director that y'all probably know best from his beautiful 1977 horror film Suspiria. Um, and this quote by him to me like really sums up why horror is important, effective, and extraordinarily compelling for so many people. Um, it's horror is like a serpent, always shedding its skin, always changing, and it will always come back. It can't be hidden away like the guilty secrets we try to keep in our subconscious. So whether we're talking about the genre or like the very concept of horror itself, it is truly inescapable for all of us. And some people want to avoid that as much as humanly possible. Uh, and that's totally fine. And then there's others of us who find it entertaining, engrossing, and weirdly cathartic. Now, onto the books. Uh, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. Um, simply because like if I didn't, we would just be here for eternity. Um, and uh, I just, I'm sorry, y'all, I don't have time for that. Uh, neither do you. But uh, on each of the title slides, I've included the summary, uh, when it was or will be released, and the Goodreads link, so you can go to it directly and investigate it for yourself. And yes, I included the 1999 action horror comedy masterpiece, The Mummy, because A, that quote is hilariously apropos here, and B, it is a perfect film. No, I will not be taking constructive criticism at this time. Anyway. We will start uh, with books geared toward our upper elementary and middle graders. So first we have The Halloween Moon by Joseph Fink, who is the creator of the podcast Welcome to Night Vale and Alice, and, and Alice Isn't Dead. Um, he also is one of the main writers of them and he writes them with Jeffrey Craner. Um, but now he's come out with this super fun middle grade book about Esther Gold, who is obsessed with Halloween, which like relatable. Uh, she goes out trick-or-treating for just one last year, only to find her town under the thrall of a mysterious presence, and she has to band together with her best friend, her grown-up neighbor, and her school bully to lift the curse on their little town. Then we have The Smash Man of Dread End by J.W. Walker. Uh, this one looks so good. Noe Wiley couldn't be more excited uh, to move and make new friends, but after the neighbor girls warn her to stay out of the basement no matter what, like, she is not having that. Noe's not going to let these girls boss her around. She's going to go in her own basement whenever she wants. So she does. And there he is. Uh, it's perfect for fans of R.L. Stein and Holly Black. Um, it looks and sounds amazing. I want to read it right now. Then we have Mine by Delilah S. Lawson. It is a twisty little ghost story about 12-year-old Lily, her creepy new home in Florida, and the ter territorial ghost of the young girl who lived there before her. Um, this is a really solid title. It's got some high-end, swampy, southern gothic vibes. I'm into it. Then we have What Lives in the Woods. This is a new title from Lindsay Curry that, like her previous novel, Scritch Scratch, it's kind of a high-intensity, like, well-woven mystery, has a lot of heart and a high creep factor. Uh, you want a creepy mansion in a spooky forest? We got your creepy mansion spooky forest right here. Then we have The List of Unspeakable Fears, which this cover is incredible, uh, by J. Casper Kramer. Um, and it's basically, like, The War That Saved My Life meets Coraline. Um, it's a historical novel. Uh, this is the author that wrote um, the story that cannot be told. And it follows this really anxious young girl learning to face her fears and her ghosts against the backdrop of the typhoid epidemic. Yes, Typhoid Mary is name dropped in this. No, you probably don't want to know more than that. And then we have The Ghost of Midnight Lake by Lucy Strange, uh, which is the greatest name for a horror writer I've ever heard. Um, but this is another historical middle grade novel that is like part ghost story, part mystery, all good. Um, when Agatha has been cast out of her ancestral home by her awful cousin, uh, she's kind of struggling to adjust to her new life and to this stranger who claims to be her real dad. Uh, and in the middle of all of this upheaval, she learns that the shores of Gosswater Lake are haunted and she soon comes face to face with the ghost of another young girl who might hold the key to Aggie's true identity. That cover is also beautiful. You'll notice, like, um, especially with these middle grade and uh, YA titles, um, there's a lot of, like, historical horror happening right now, which I'm really, really into. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a trend I've kind of noticed. It's not the only trend that I've noticed, obviously, um, but that's one that I noticed in the titles that I picked to show you guys. Now, uh, let's ease on into the titles that are geared more toward teens. Um, which, by the way, uh, 
this is like one of the posters for the um, Netflix film trilogy event, Fear Street, which are based on uh, the books. And um, it's super great. If you haven't watched them, please go watch them. They're awesome. So first, we have The Mary Shelley Club by Goldie Moldovsky. Um, <laughs> I love Mary Shelley. I always have. I always will. And so I saw this cover and was immediately like, oh, I need to look at this. And then I read the summary and it sounds amazing. Uh, and it came out in April, but I haven't gotten to read it yet. Um, all that to say, it came out in April. So if y'all don't already have it yet, definitely get this one. Um, so it, it's kind of like, it's billed as Scream meets Karen McManus, and uh, it features another young woman. Uh, her name is Rachel. She's trying to make her way in a new school. She gets caught up in a prank that goes, like, really, really wrong. Um, but in doing so, she comes to the attention of this super secret club called the Mary Shelley Club. Uh, and the club's purpose is to come up with the scariest prank imaginable and create real fear. But of course, the competition does not remain friendly. Uh, and eventually, when the club itself becomes a target, Rachel is going to have to confront her past to keep a hold of her future. Then we have The River Has Teeth, um, which is another incredible cover and such a great title. Um, this is by Erica Waters, who wrote Ghostwood Song, which is also excellent. Um, so uh, when Natasha's sister disappears and the case goes cold, uh, Natasha turns desperately to Della, who is a local girl rumored to be a witch, uh, in the hopes that Della's family magic might be able to bring her sister home. Uh, but Della's also keeping secrets, because she thinks the beast responsible for the disappearances, of which there are multiple, is maybe her own mother, who has uh, turned into a terrible monster by some magic gone wrong. Uh, this book has a lot. It's got mystery, it's got family bonds, it's got queer rip and angry witchy women. That's like all my favorite things. I love that. Then we have The Perfect Place to Die by Bryce Moore. Uh, this is another historical title with a famous character. Uh, so when Zaretta's sister goes missing after traveling to the World's Fair, uh, Zaretta has to navigate 1890 Chicago in order to investigate the matter herself. When she finds out that her sister's last place of employment was this mysterious hotel known as the Castle, Zaretta takes a job there in hopes of getting to the bottom of things. Um, but she doesn't realize that the castle is the home and playground of one of America's most notorious serial killers. That's right, y'all. This book's got H.H. H. Holmes in it. Then we have The Dead and the Dark by Courtney Gould. Um, it is a thrill from start to finish, and it has a gorgeous cover. I am obsessed with it. Um, so Logan Ortiz Woodley has never been to Snakebite, Oregon before, but when her dads, who are also like these popular TV ghost hunters, uh, called the Paraspectors, uh, they're on TV. Uh, when they take her back with them, Logan feels like they maybe didn't tell her everything about this place because there is something wrong in Snakebite. Uh, teens are going missing and winding up dead. There's all this weird stuff happening, and Logan and her family's arrival is, like, concerningly timed. Uh, but Logan may be Ashley's only hope, because Ashley's boyfriend was the first to go missing, and she's kind of felt his presence around ever since. But now that Logan and her dads are here, he's, like, following her around for real. And that is only the tip of the iceberg in this weird, dark, twisty, queer novel about family and hauntings and buried deep secrets. Then we have White Smoke by Tiffany D. Jackson, who um, is one of the authors on this list that you truly cannot go wrong with. Uh, it is a terrifying and engrossing novel, and it's being billed as like The Haunting of Hill House meets Get Out. Um, so Marigold is leaving her rough past behind, uh, and she's moving with her newly blended family, uh, her mom uh, and her little brother, and then her stepdad and her new stepsister. Um, they're moving from California to this small Midwestern town of Cedarwood, you know, very picturesque, very nice. They even live on Maple Street. Um, but the house on Maple Street is not exactly what it seems. It's not cute. Uh, there are strange noises, things are disappearing, there are all kinds of weird smells and phantom voices, and then her stepsister's mysterious new imaginary friend um, seems to want Marigold gone. Uh, the last part gives me some serious, like, Mary Dining Hans, Wait Till Helen Comes vibes, and I am into that. Then we have The Corpse Queen by Heather Herman. Um, 
So this is uh, another like kind of twisty feminist horror thriller featuring a teen girl turned grave robber as she gets caught up in the plans of a murderer. Uh, so when her best friend mysteriously dies, Molly gets shipped off with her estranged, wealthy, quote unquote, aunt, Ava, who robs graves and sells the bodies to medical students, which is a real thing that used to happen all the time, in case y'all didn't know. Uh, you know, for science, uh, Molly gets roped into the scheme, and in the meantime, she gets interested in the anatomy lessons that are being held in the old church on her aunt's property by Dr. LaSalle, and she desperately wants to become one of the doctor's students, but um, it's more than just the fact that she's a woman that's holding her back. There is also a killer on the loose, because of course there is. And last for the YA teen novels, we have uh, To Break a Covenant by Alice Names, which features two young women who are best friends, maybe more, as they try to figure out exactly what's going on in their town, which has been haunted ever since an explosion in the mine killed 16 people and left these underground fires that make it impossible to live in. Uh, the townspeople resettled nearby and rely on the tourism the disaster brings, but no one wants to admit that it's not all just rumors. Uh, Clem and Nina, the two aforementioned best friends, um, and eventually two more girls who arrived to town just in time for things to go to completely haywire, find themselves entering the abandoned mine themselves to figure out what's going on before it's too late. Um, I love mines. Uh, I love, like, uh, mining town related stories that is, you know, uh, for obvious reasons, like a staple in kind of Southern, like Appalachian horror, which I am super into. So I cannot wait for this to come out. And also that cover is incredible. All right, buckle up y'all. It is time for the adult titles. And, um, for those of you who don't know, this is the Necronomicon from Evil Dead. Um, <laughs> So first, we have The Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. Um, it is exactly what it says on the tin, and I mean that in a good way. Uh, this is the author that brought you My Best Friend's Exorcism and The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, among other titles. Uh, and this new one looks like a trip. Um, a support group of women who have survived harrowing ordeals and attempted murders find themselves in a race against the clock to figure out who's targeting them and how the remaining final girls can take them down first, because they're survivals. After all, that's what they do. Um, you really cannot go wrong with Grady Hendrix. Um, like, all of his books are great. There's one called uh, Horror Store that's basically a haunted Ikea. Yeah, I, I, what else can I say about that? That's incredible. You need to get all the Grady Hendrix books, too. Then we have Come With Me by Ronald Malfi. It's a dark psychological thriller about secrets and obsession. Now, here's the thing, um, just real quick. A lot of people will argue, you know, that um, things that fall more into the true crime slash thriller category um, are not horror. And I mean, they're not wrong, but for a, a general, like, layman that's not necessarily super into horror or who just doesn't think about things that way um they probably lump all of that all together so i did include like some thrillers as you'll notice on this list um so but just note that like typically when you talk about horror um you're talking about like speculative fiction um so yeah just bear that in mind anyway uh come with me so um, Aaron Decker's wife dies, uh, and he finds himself haunted by a lot of questions, as well as sort of her ghost. Um, and he ends up digging through her stuff, and he finds a receipt for a motel on the other side of the country. And he is curious and desperate and, most importantly, grieving. So he sets off to figure out what she was doing there and why. Uh, but he is not ready for what he finds. Then we have Revelator by Daryl Gregory, um, and it is a doozy of a historical Southern Gothic horror novel from the author of Spoonbenders. Um, did I mention earlier that I love, like, you know, dark, like, Appalachian horror mining town aesthetic? Because I do, and uh, this also is, is really, like, kind of in that category. Um, so in 1933, Stella's nine, and she is left in the care of her grandma, Maddie, in the remote hills of Tennessee. Um, Stella finds out about her family's strange religion when she meets their personal god, who's an entity known simply as Ghost Daddy, up close and personal when she's wandering through this nearby cave. So then something happens a few years later, and she leaves. Uh, and when she comes back years after that, um, as a bootlegger, <laughs> after uh, many years for Maddie's funeral, she's also trying to look after the young girl that Maddie adopted some years before. 
and Sunny seems all right at first, but appearances can be deceiving, and Sunny's about to send Stella on a road trip down memory lane where her shadowed past and her family's destructive religion will not stay buried. Because nothing stays buried, especially in the remote backwoods of Tennessee. Then we have My Heart is a Chainsaw by Stephen Graham Jones. I know I've already mentioned him before, but... Uh, <sighs> Honestly, like everything of Stephen Graham Jones that I've read is incredible. Um, he's the one who uh, last year came out with The Only Good Indians and a couple of years before that, Mongrels. He's amazing. Um, and My Heart is a Chainsaw is uh, the story of Jade Daniels, who is an angry half-native outcast in a slowly gentrifying town with a crappy family and no outlet except for horror movies. Uh, Jade gives us the lowdown on her little town's history through the lens of those horror movies that she knows and loves. Uh, and then things take a turn, and the blood actually begins to run. Uh, and she uses every bit of that encyclopedic horror movie knowledge to figure out exactly what's going to happen next. Um, you really can't go wrong with Stephen Graham Jones, and this is just a loving homage to the horror film genre that looks delightful. Then we have Summer Sons by Lee Mandelo. Um, it's another gothic horror novel, this time set in present day, though, and it's about two inseparable best, inseparable best friends, Andrew and Eddie, whose bond is finally broken when one of them goes off to college and then, like, six months later dies. Um, and Andrew is left behind with the strangers that made up Eddie's new life, um, slowly uncovered secrets about the boy Andrew once knew, and a vengeful, bloody ghost that he cannot escape. Um... Ooh, that looks good. And that cover is beautiful. Y'all, the covers are so incredible this year. Um, I just, oh, I, I love a good visual. Also, you've got um, Alexi e. Harrow, who's another incredible author, saying, I couldn't put it down. So if that's not a ringing endorsement for this one, I don't know what it is. Then we have The Death of Jane Lawrence uh, by Caitlin Starling. Um, this sort of feels like a Bronte novel come to life turned up to 11. Um, Jane Shoringfield, she proposes a marriage of practicality to this intriguing but reclusive doctor, Augustine Lawrence, um, and he agrees, except for one condition. She is not to set foot anywhere near his creepy, crumbly family estate. And obviously, things don't go according to plan. Um, and it's set in this kind of like dark mirror version of post-war England. It's a little bit Rebecca, a little bit Shirley Jackson, but with a new kind of twisty angle that'll keep the lovers of those classics on their toes. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of Crimson Peak inspired. Uh, either way, it also looks incredible and creepy and atmospheric. And then, like, swinging to the opposite of that, we have Reprieve by James Han Matson. Um, in 1997, which I hate to tell y'all, but 1997 now qualifies as historical. I'm so sorry. <laughs> But, uh, so in 1997, four contestants make it to the final cell of the Quigley House, which is this notorious uh, full-contact haunted escape room in Nebraska. And if the group can make it through the final uh, without shouting the safe word, which is reprieve, they will win, like, this big cash prize. But before they can finish, uh, someone breaks into the cell and kills one of the contestants. And as each of the remaining contestants who are there that night give testimony, their prejudices, obsessions, and lies are brought to light uh, that paint a startling portrait of how they each contributed to the situation in what is a scathing critique of capitalism and terror as entertainment and the culture of complicity. Um, and it looks, ooh, this one, like, it looks intense. And finally, we have Nothing But Blackened Teeth by Cassandra Call. Um, I will read anything Cassandra Call writes. Like, they're amazing. And also this cover, this cover is so unsettling. Um, this is a, a novella, but um, they've also got another, like, full-length novel coming out, The All-Consuming World. Um, and I've been waiting for that one for a while, um, but it's not like strictly horrors, how I wanted to go with uh, nothing but blackened teeth um, so that y'all could really, really get that like nice, dark, creepy vibe just in time for Halloween. Um, so a centuries old abandoned Japanese mansion sits on top of the bones of a sorrowful bride, as well as the bodies of the girl sacrificed to keep her company each year as she waits for her husband to return home to her. Um, so of course, a group of friends decide that this is like the perfect spot for a wedding. Um, but they are not expecting a bride to already be there. 
but it's too late now. Um, Y'all, like for real, everything Cassandra Call writes is enjoyable and it ranges from beautifully dark to absolutely hideously gross. Um, but no matter what, it is always, always a ride. So I am super down to read this one next. So to wrap up, um, I've got some additional resources for you here for horror titles that have come out recently or are soon to be released this year first. Uh, there is the Goodreads 2021 horror release list. Um, there is a really like fantastic roundup from Nightfire of like all the books they're excited about this year. And I really like that one because it also sends you to um, the publisher's page and it kind of gives like a little short um, kind of rundown of like the vibes of each book uh, all along this list. So that one's really good. And then we have got um, the middle grade horror tag on the Ladies of Horror Fiction website, which like it does these monthly new release roundups. Um, so if you just like click that link, you know, and you go to that tag, then you can go back month by month and see middle grade horror novels that um, are coming out or have come out and you can go from there. Um, Additionally, I also want to point you to my Reader's Advisory Board on Pinterest, and here, like, I've linked you directly to the horror, thriller, and true crime section, but you can always go back to, like, the main Reader's Advisory Board and find more, because I've got, like, all different kinds of categories, but I've also got, um, like, one for articles, and there's a lot of articles about, you know, like, different kind of horror genre stuff, because, you know, sorry, y'all, that's, it's, it's my favorite thing. I can't help it. Um, but then um, I've also linked you to the Monster She Wrote podcast, specifically this episode, which features Becky Spratford, um, and it discusses horror RA for children and middle graders. Um, it's an excellent listen, and while you're at it, you need to immediately check out the book that um, this podcast is based on. Its full title is Monster She Wrote, The Women Who Pioneered Horror and Speculative Fiction, uh, and the editors uh, also host a podcast, and one of them, Melanie R. Anderson, is actually an English professor at Delta State University here in Cleveland, Mississippi. Um, it is a really, really great podcast. It's a really, really great book. Um, I would just advise it, you know, for pretty much anyone. All right. Thank you for watching. Um, hopefully I didn't go too fast and hopefully I didn't drag on for eternity. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, you can find me at kmartin-gant at mlc.lib.ms.us or you can call me um, at 601-432-4057, though I'm more likely to answer email um, just because like I'm more likely to see it. Um, for this slide deck and a handout of additional resources because you know, I didn't want to leave anything out and I have a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, I made uh, an additional little handout. You can click this bit.ly link here um, and I'm going to put it in the video description. Um, but then you can download the slide deck and you can download that handout. And yeah, if you got any questions, just let me know. Thanks.